If you haven't read Mr. Widemouth, you can listen to it here and read along here. This analysis video is a companion piece to my rendition of it and contains spoilers. Mr. Widemouth hits on just about every positive aspect of the subgenre of horror known as creepypasta. It's a perfectly written anecdotal account of an adult remembering an experience of being extremely ill just before moving away from a house he only resided in for five months. The narrator begins by stating in the second paragraph, most of these memories are unclear and pointless, which I believe is a phrase that can be applied to many creepypastas, and that's not a bad thing. In these types of accounts, the narrator should act humble and play off the story like it's nothing special. The blog style of writing and false modesty pull us into the mundane world of the narrator, and it's in this fog of boredom that we become sensitive to incoming information. We notice qualities of the world around us we'd normally forget in a matter of hours, maybe a matter of days. This, compounded with the fact that our narrator is suffering from mono, brings a monicum of doubt into the narrator's mind about just how accurate his recollections of previous events are. They might be lucid dreams as he describes them. The first four paragraphs go on describing details about the places and populations. It describes the house the story takes place in, the details about it being barren because of the impending move, and we're given insight into why our narrator is just so bored. Everything is packed up. He's sick and maybe just a little delirious, and above all else, he's lonely. His father's unmentioned profession causes our narrator to move constantly, preventing him from finding a real friend. He didn't even have friends over for his birthday. Our narrator was as depressed as a five-year-old can be. It's under these circumstances that Mr. Widemouth appears. He's introduced with a wonderful line that gives me pause every time I read it. I don't exactly recall how I met Mr. Widemouth. This line is punchy and brilliant in its ambiguity. We don't know what Mr. Widemouth is for sure, and that's okay. We don't need it spelled out for us. He could be an imaginary friend, a fever dream, a troll-like creature that hit around the house, or a devil-like creature seeking to lead naive children astray. Whatever caused Mr. Widemouth to appear, his purpose is clear. Entertain our narrator's impatient, bored, and lonely brain. Mr. Widemouth is described as being like a Furby. This is a small bit of 1990s nostalgia. The problem that many creepypastas run into even mentioning nostalgia in their plot is the over-reliance on it. It becomes a crutch. However, the mention of a Furby, which was considered creepy by many children in the 90s, adds the proper amount of nostalgia in. Nostalgia should be about a feeling of a sense of loss. It's rediscovering memories buried deep in your mind and becoming afraid that you'll forget them again. Millennials will undoubtedly feel this emotion at the mention of a Furby. It's just a dash of nostalgia to bring out the surreal nature of the rest of the experience. The first thing you'll notice about Mr. Widemouth is that he knows how to talk to our narrator. He tells our narrator what he wants to hear and manipulates him in the way, say, a child molester would. He says things like, it's a secret game, and I'm afraid they won't let us play anymore. We instinctively know that telling a child these sorts of things is wrong, the idea is to put the responsibility of bad things happening onto the child. Cut out the parents from the child's life. This is dangerous and damaging for a child's psychological development. We then get to the part where Mr. Widemouth suggests dangerous games like jumping out of a window and juggling knives. For comparison, let's look at what Jeff the Killer does with a kitchen knife. He kills people. That's it. Nothing more. Not torture them. Not threaten them. He doesn't use a knife to promote an unstable or fringe idea. He doesn't use a knife to achieve some sort of interesting and unpredictable plot twist. He's just a killer. Meanwhile, 
Mr. Winemouth is pressuring a child into doing obviously dangerous things. He's a monster that's taking advantage of a child's boredom to cure his own boredom. This is the problem of peer pressure and something that's very relatable to a lot of us. It's not literal peer pressure, but that's what its effect is. It's a relatable problem for just about anyone that's far enough from childhood to reflect on it, but not so far away that they forget it. A lot of us millennials are there right now, and we see the way that children are condescended to. When one reads the story without looking at the fan art of Mr. Widemouth, the image created is powerful. I'd avoid looking at fan art because much of it robs Mr. Widemouth of his impact. To picture a naive child conversing with a strange, clearly insidious, impish creature that constantly suggests dangerous games gives me an unwelcome feeling. The child is sensing a danger, but doesn't grasp the scope of just how dangerous this little evil creature is. Then place that creature in a bedroom window, giving a wave goodbye with a steak knife. This gives me the impression that the narrator moved away just in time. Mr. Widemouth was becoming impatient and bored, just like our narrator, and Mr. Widemouth was tired of waiting for the narrator to kill himself. Every creepypasta, or story for that matter, should end with an impactful line of some sort. It doesn't always need to be a twist or fridge horror revelation, but in this story, where the creepy nature is weaved all throughout the plot, it's truly surprising to reach an end with such an unsettling revelation that there was a graveyard at the end of the deer trail Mr. Widemouth showed our narrator. Now I enjoy the rest of this footage, but I've got nothing else to say on the matter, so I'll let this ride out. If you have something to contribute, please leave a comment. If you would like more content like this, consider subscribing.